good morning. Sorry, I was just out telling everyone about our trip to the Boundary Waters, which we just got back from on Friday, so lost track of the time. We got lots of stories to tell, so if you're hanging around for coffee and donuts, sit by me if you want to find out more. I don't know. Speaking of coffee and donuts, we have fellowship time after worship at 10.30 a.m. We appreciate that you are here with us worshiping today. I'm Pastor Ashley. Youth, 7th through 12th graders, you can have lunch with me this Wednesday at noon out on the lawn. I know we just spent a week together, most of us, but some of you were not there, and so I would love to see you. And even if you were there, plan to come join me on the lawn, bring your own lunch and a chair. PRISM is collecting a variety of food donations. You can find out more in your bulletin on page 14. They're having a drive through birthday party and they need food donations for that. They are also looking especially for breakfast cereal, mac and cheese, and kid-friendly snacks. More information, as I said, in your bulletin. This Friday night, we're doing a drive-in movie theater showing Mrs. Doubtfire, a classic, at 8.45. So plan to join us in the parking lot for that. And then we still are in need of some summer musicians to share your gifts and talents with us in worship. You can sign up online. There is a note in your bulletin about where you can do that. Lots of other stuff coming up, including a ball game in September and the women's book study in August. So go ahead and read all of these announcements when you get the chance. But right now, I invite you to turn to page three in your bulletin as we prepare ourselves for worship. We come together, I forgot something. It's like I've been gone or something. We come together in this place to be people of worship. By your presence, you are welcome to take part in all that is done. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in 
the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. We sing together our gathering hymn, hymn number 786. I invite you to please stand as you are able. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
pray together. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each one of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. 
then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Ephesians. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We prepare to hear the gospel by singing the Alleluia as noted in your bulletin. Please stand as you're able. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> Thank you. 
At first glance, this seems like a bit of an odd choice for a gospel reading. We get these two little sections of Mark strangely separated by about 20 verses. Without any context, we might wonder what is going on here. Why focus on these two short stories of Jesus and the disciples as they seem to try to get away for a while, but end up being mobbed by crowds of people? Especially when we realize that the verses that we skipped here contain the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the story of Jesus walking on water. Two of the most well-known stories about Jesus. To be fair, though, we do get those elsewhere in the lectionary. But it feels like these two sections that we do get today are transitional, if not inconsequential, as a part of Mark's larger narrative. But of course, any words that Mark chose to include in his gospel are important. Papyrus space was no doubt at a premium. And we know enough about Mark to know that he was brief with his storytelling, so any words that he chose to include were done so with intention. So why did Mark think this was important? For me, it would seem to be that the, a word that gets repeated in each of these short sections, and that word is recognized. In both of these brief stories, that seems to be central to what is going on here. In the first section, we hear that the disciples have returned to Jesus to which we might respond, well, I didn't realize they had gone. But just before this, we hear that Jesus had sent them out two by two into the neighboring towns to preach repentance, to cast out demons, and to heal people. And they had done it. We aren't told how long they were gone, but we are told that they traveled about and they did the work that Jesus had sent them to do. And now they are back. And we can imagine them eager to tell Jesus about everything that happened to them when they were out doing the things he told them to do. Jesus seems to realize just how exhausted they must have been, and he suggests that they go away for a little while. Get some rest. Take a vacation. Go to the wilderness. Our text actually says it's a, they go to, try to go to a deserted place, but that word deserted place is also often translated as wilderness place, which seems somehow fitting, especially for those who have just returned from the boundary waters. Our wilderness. But of course, this getaway to the wilderness does not go as planned. Jesus and his disciples get in a boat. They start heading across the lake, but just as they're leaving, people, and there's the word, recognize him. They know him. They know what he can do. They want to be a part of it. So as Jesus and the disciples apparently take a leisurely boat ride across the lake, I only assume that because the crowd beats them there as they go around the lake. It's almost humorous, right, to imagine Jesus and the disciples crossing the lake in a boat and all these people running around the other side and beat him there. So when they arrive in the wilderness, instead of finding nothing, which is what they wanted, they find a great crowd of people is there to greet them. Surprise. Now skip ahead to the second section of this reading, and this is after Jesus has fed the 5,000, after he has walked on water. Jesus and the disciples are back in the boat, crossing the lake again. But this time, instead of going to the wilderness, they are going to Gennesaret. We're not told why they're going there, but it would seem likely that they are still trying to find that rest, trying to find that getaway, trying to get away from everything and everyone. They're still looking for their vacation. But why Gennesaret? 
What do we even know about Gennesaret? Well, I did a slight amount of research, and I discovered that one thing we know about Gennesaret is it was known as a place of healing. It was the location of a number of hot springs, and hot springs have long been considered places of healing. So maybe Jesus and the disciples wanted to go there to take a dip in a hot spring-fed pool. Or maybe they were looking for healing themselves. Or maybe they thought that anybody who was there wouldn't need them to heal them because they'd already found healing with the hot springs. Or maybe they just thought the people in Gennesaret wouldn't recognize them. But no. We're told that as soon as they get out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus. And once again, a great crowd forms, and people are running around trying to gather as many sick people as they can to bring to Jesus to be healed. Apparently, the hot, spring, hot springs hadn't done the trick. But Jesus will. And they know it. And he does. So all of this recognizing of Jesus pointed out by Mark would seem, in one sense, to serve the purpose of showing us just how famous Jesus is getting at this point in the story. This is still fairly early in Mark's Gospel, but it's far enough in that Jesus is definitely famous enough that he can't walk down the street or cross a lake without being recognized. Mark wants us to realize that this fame is growing, which, as we know, will put him on a collision course with the religious leaders and the Roman Empire, neither of which is willing to put up with a religious leader attracting great crowds of people. But what is more important than Jesus' fame is why he is famous. He's famous because he's a great teacher, he's a great healer, and he's a worker of miracles. All of these things point to who Jesus is. But the one thing that is maybe even more important than that, we hear in this text. We hear Jesus looked at those crowds of people gathered and who had come to him, and he had compassion for them. This may be the most important thing we hear about Jesus. He had compassion for them. And now instead of being about how we understand Jesus, this becomes about how Jesus understands us. Which is more important. This church spends a lot of time and resources studying and discussing theology. I mean, I guess rightfully so, right? Which is the understanding of God, how we understand God, the study of God. But I don't know that we spend enough time thinking about how God understands us. How do we think God views us individually and as a whole? How does God understand you? I don't know if we want to think about that too much. What do you think God thinks when God looks at you? I tend to think that if we think about it at all, we probably feel some sense of guilt or shame. We maybe think about the things we've done or haven't done that we might be judged for. We honestly too often think of God as some righteous judge. But if Jesus is our central image for God, then there is not judging. There's compassion. That compassion is what it is really central to these two stories. Jesus looks at the crowd of people and has compassion on them. We are told that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then in Gennesaret, Jesus healed the sick wherever he went. People even were healed by simply touching the fringe of his cloak. Jesus has compassion for people. And Jesus heals people. This is who Jesus is, which means this is who God is. 
And what this means is that Jesus looked at people, Jesus recognized them, Jesus saw them for who they were, and Jesus had compassion for them. And the same is true for us. Jesus looks at us, Jesus recognizes us, Jesus sees us. And Jesus has compassion for us. And what that means, because we know Jesus sees who we really are, what that really means is that we don't have to hide. We don't have to hide who we really are from God or from each other. Because Jesus sees it all. Jesus recognizes it all. Jesus has compassion. In a way, these crowds of people chasing after Jesus, they seem kind of desperate, especially in that second part of the story, right? They're just running around trying to gather all the people who need healing. And I don't don't know that we want to feel that way, right? We don't like to feel desperate. We don't want to appear desperate. So in order to not appear desperate, we tend to hide. We hide our pain. We hide our weaknesses. We hide our authentic selves. But we don't have to do that. Jesus sees us and has compassion for us. And Jesus is calling us out to be who we are, to show our desperation when we are desperate, to not be afraid to be authentic, to not worry about appearing weak. Because whoever we are deep down, Jesus sees it. Jesus sees all of us, and Jesus, I'll say it again, has compassion and recognizes us. And Jesus offers healing and wholeness when we are feeling broken. This is what he offered those crowds of people, and this is what he came to offer us. Amen.
the Holy Spirit, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We continue to worship God with our offering. If you are worshiping with us here in person, there is an offering plate in the narthex as you leave. If you are worshiping with us online, you can mail in your donation or give online as well. As always, we thank you so very much for your continued generosity. And now we invite any children to come forward for children's time with Pastor Jason. Who's gonna come? All right, we got a few. Awesome. Good morning. How's it going? It's all right. Yeah. So I'm wondering if uh, you guys have any. Uh, have you gone on vacation this summer, or do you have a vacation coming up? Any vacation plans? You have? Where'd you go? Green Bay. Well, I mean, who wouldn't want to go there? Was it, was it fun? So why did you go to Green Bay? To see your grandparents. So there you go. So why, why do we go on vacation? There's one, one answer, right? To visit family. That's a, an, often a reason we go on vacation. Can you think of any other reasons we go on vacation? To get, out, get away from day-to-day -day life. Yeah, to maybe get a break, to rest, right? Yeah, that's a really good reason. I, uh, I, like two weeks ago, I was on vacation for a week. My family went to the North Shore of Lake Superior, which we go, we go every year. But that's very much a vacation that's about just getting away and resting and relaxing. And I mean, we do fun stuff, but it's also like the lake is beautiful, and we're just going to kind of sit here and play some games and listen to the waves come in and maybe do a puzzle, read, stuff like that. Yeah. So what are some reasons we might go on vacation? Anything? Any ideas? For an occasion. Like a holiday? Yeah? Or maybe we're going, like, what kind of occasion are we getting? Like Christmas? Yeah? Like a wedding? Sometimes we might go on a vacation to go to, some, to somebody's wedding that's somewhere else, right? Yeah? Yeah. Sometimes we go on vacations just to see something new, right? I was realizing that it was four years ago, right now, I was with a group of people from here in Germany. We went to a, did a trip to Germany. And that was very much about seeing things that I had never, for me at least, seeing some new things that I had never seen before that I wanted to see. It was very cool. So there are lots of reasons we go on vacation. Now, do you ever think, do you think Jesus ever went on vacation? You think so? When did he go on vacation? Anytime he left and came back? It would be like a vacation. Well, he traveled a lot, right? He walked around from different towns to different town, towns. So it might feel like it was a constant vacation. Somehow I don't think Jesus would have considered it a vacation. But yeah, I mean, he was seeing all, all sorts of different places. So in that sense, it was kind of like a vacation, right? And there were times when Jesus would get away. I don't, and again, I don't know that he would consider it a vacation, but it was definitely about getting away to rest, to relax. He would go off and pray by himself. That was one thing, one of the things that Jesus did 
fairly regularly. Right? But in our gospel story today, we heard that Jesus, you could think of it as this way, he tried to take his disciples on a vacation. He tried. I don't know if you heard the story or paying attention, but he did not succeed. Right? He decided to get in a boat with his disciples, which is another thing that he did fairly regularly. They crossed the lake, got to the other side, which was a very wilderness-type area. Right? There, was, there shouldn't have been anybody else there. It was like getting away to the boundary waters. Maybe not the boundary waters, but wilderness. And they got there, and the crowds of people had followed. In fact, they had gotten ahead of them, which is crazy. Right? They crossed the lake. The people are going around the lake. It seems like going around. I don't know the math, but that's long. Right? Yeah. And they were on foot. You think a boat would be faster? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. So it didn't work out, but it, this shows us that Jesus did think that it was important at times to have that break, to get that rest, to have what he might have called Sabbath, right? Sabbath is all about rest. We think about Sabbath as being one day, right? Today, Sunday, right? But Sabbath can be longer. It can be a break away from everything, a time of rest, a time of relaxation, a time to kind of recharge, right? And I think Jesus knew that was important, even though he didn't always succeed at it, like in today's story. Because he was very popular and people wanted to see him and be with him and get healed by him. But it shows us that for us too, that is important. We need those times sometimes just to, to get away, to get away from our day to day life. I think there's a lot of value in that. And Jesus kind of shows us that today. All right. You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you for coming up. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all those in need. Tend your church, O God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Lord, in your mercy. Heal your people, O oh God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially Michelle Hansen, Dory Olmsted, and those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nourish this congregation, O oh God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You lead us home, O oh God. We give thanks for all who have died now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Lord, in your mercy. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the light of God surround us, the love of God enfold us, and the presence of God watch over and protect us. For wherever we are, our God is also there. We close as we began in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our mission hymn, hymn number 789. Please stand as you are able. Thanks be to God.